Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I finally got my microphone issue sorted out. I have a studio downstairs and there's never a problem because it's all sort of wired in. But I, I realized when recording on this software, my computer has to be plugged in because the microphone re requires power. So we should have better sound this time and the video should be good as well. I'm in my uh, kitchen, which my, my lovely wife, if you can see, you can't really see. Anyway, she's a wonderful decorator, so I thought I'd sit up here. In any case, well, we talk about the crisis in the church all the time. And that's sort of the shtick, isn't it, on YouTube? And we know how bad it is. And it is what it is, as they say. And it doesn't look like, well, it doesn't look like, you know, within the next week or two, things are going to be that much better. In fact, it's probably going to play out in a, in a very rocky way for a little while. So we have to take courage and we have to take advice from people who know what they're talking about. And there was a video that went around, I think it was about two years ago. Mel Gibson was sending his support to some canceled priests. And it went viral. And I remember it sort of made the rounds and people said, wow, you know. And today somebody sent me a clip of that. Just a clip. I hadn't seen this video in, you know, two years, whenever it was. And I was watching Mel Gibson speak about the crisis in the church and kind of how to navigate through the murky waters of the Second Vatican Council and the post conciliar era, all of the confusion. And he actually had, you know, I forgot how knowledgeable he was about the Catholic faith and the things that he said were actually quite useful. And I think that we can learn about how to use our Catholic sense to navigate through these stormy waters. So I thought we'd watch some of this together and sort of springboard into some useful tips to help us navigate through this crisis because it might get worse. Who knows? Uh, but even as it stands, things are confusing and difficult. So we need to learn how to be able to make our own decisions because other people can't make them for us. At your rally today, the Coalition for Cancelled Priests. I mean, it's not hard to believe that there is now such a thing. As personally, I know many priests uh, who have been canceled, but not for the reasons you'd think. I mean, it's not like they did a hit and run drive and left the scene of the crime or embezzled church funds, stole the altar wine or committed some other heinous crime. No, not at all. And who's persecuting them? Well, their own bishops. How's that? Yep. Who are they? Well, they're a pack of men who generally passively sit by and tolerate any kind of nonsense. But if one of their priests under something that resembles orthodoxy, well, then they, they spring into action, they reprimand him, and they bully him and do their best to cancel him. And it succeed. They drum him out of the service, you know. Off he goes. Um, I'm really sorry about that. That's a grave injustice, and it's kind of white martyrdom. So right off the bat, he makes this useful distinction between priests who are canceled for reasons of, you know, canonical crimes. They did something really bad and we, we don't want Judas to remain in the priesthood, so to speak. But he's exactly right. And about the fact that the bishops will find their priests and just sort of take them off, put them out to the pasture. And I've seen it. You know, you think it's only the traditional priests. It's not. Like he said, it's priests who say anything that resembles Catholic orthodoxy. And that's exactly correct. It's a psychological warfare that they play with these men. Uh, they start talking about Thomas Aquinas too much in their sermons. Students ask them when they do visits to schools about, you know, sexuality, God forbid. <laughs> Is hell real? Etc. 
and I've seen it myself, and I've seen priests priests basically be pushed to the brink of mental instability because of the way they were treated by bishops and usually henchmen of bishops. Mel Gibson has a history of growing up in the traditional Catholic movement. And his father was very um, involved in, I think they call it the Sede Privationist movement or the Sede Privationist position. Essentially, this is, I'm sorry if I make a mistake on this, but that they're, the, the office of the Pope is still there and the men who hold the chair don't have the authority. I think that's what's believed, although different people have different definitions. But the point is, he grew up in a household where his father looked at the crisis in the church and took action and said, this is the decision that I have to make for my family. And people may disagree with that, but clearly Gibson was raised in a home where concrete steps were taken to deal with the crisis. And again, I'm not recommending the Sede Privationist position or a Sede Vacantist position, but I am saying if somebody arrives at that point, they've really considered things. And it sounds like Gibson knows what he's talking about. And I think that's evident with what he continues to say here. And it's nothing new. It really isn't. It's nothing new. Um, and it's a symptom. It's a symptom of a very deep sickness that afflicts the church. It didn't. What is that sickness? What is this deep sickness that afflicts the church? It's modernism. It's complete doctrinal evolution and relativism. And uh, it makes true reform impossible because... The terms are meaningless and you can't latch on to anything. This is why it's maddening to watch debates between essentially what you'd call traditionalists and anti-traditionalists. It's maddening uh, because the one group is arguing with terms that have set definitions that have stood the test of time for centuries and millennia. And the other group is using terms in a squishy serpentine way and you can't grab hold of anything. He's absolutely correct. The sickness is, is, is profound not happen overnight. Um, if anyone's familiar with the missives of Archbishop Vigano, he says that the, uh, you know, the seeds of erosion of the church were sown at, with the reforms of Vatican II, and I agree with him. He suggests even that we scrap the whole thing and go back and do it the way it was before. And it was a pastoral council after all. I mean, uh, you know, uh, there was nothing wrong. It didn't need to be fixed. They were doing pretty well. At any rate, and, and you know, I've had my own run-in with the bishops. I mean, who are they? Well, they're... I, I remember when I directed The Passion, I, I went to the USCCB uh, to get support for the film. And um, those men couldn't get away from me fast enough. And all but a few of them turned their back on me. And it was, it was pretty telling about who they were. A pretty insipid bunch. And Can you imagine? We're told, we have been told for so long that actually, yeah, that's right. I don't want to go into too many tangents. We've been told for so long that it's about the new evangelization and it's about reaching the people and it's about using the media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know that the passion is one of the greatest films ever made. I mean, it's a piece of art, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like the Beethoven's ninth of films. It's, it's, it's a piece of art that could only be made possible by there's just a special type of intellect and an ability to see things in such a three-dimensional way and pull together so many pieces 
that you couldn't make that film if you weren't Mel Gibson. You couldn't do it. It's unbelievable, that movie. Like, so many Catholics and Christians of all stripes have watched that every year as an Easter Lenten sort of thing. And m many Catholics, as I said, that wouldn't even call themselves traditionalists and would never dare speak a word about the shortcomings of their bishop, you know, the one who wants you to think Pachamama was a was not an idol and that, uh, you know, if you don't take the same medicine as everybody else, then you're a bad person. But those same bishops turn their back on Gibson. You know, I never once remember in my diocese, maybe I'm, maybe it, maybe it happened, but I don't think it did. I don't ever remember them saying we're going to be holding a screening for, to watch the passion as a parish or something, but they do put on alpha nights, the Protestant evangelization program. They do have tree planting ceremonies with the Anglicans and the Muslim Imam, but they won't get you to watch the passion. Amazing. Gibson will talk. This is the funny thing. It's not funny. It's sad. Gibson will go to these Protestant events or these events of Christians who just are willing to have him to talk about his films. And they're so excited about the passion. And it is easily the most Catholic film ever made. <laughs> you know, there are bishops and priests promoting the chosen. And the chosen, in, in fairness, it is beautifully made. The people who made it are objectively very good artists. I think it's very, you know, I'm, 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 I'm it's too bad there are certain doctrinal problems in it, like with the pain of Mary giving childbirth and things. And I know Protestants don't necessarily understand these things are blasphemous. And I'm, I haven't watched more than a couple episodes, and that was when it first came out. But, but my point is, is that you know this film. There are like uh, this this show, The Chosen. There are, you know, like viewing nights at the parishes and dioceses and things. But they can't get behind the passion of the Christ. It just it just tells you everything you need to know. And uh, it doesn't look like anything's changed. Geez, I remember back in the seventies, uh, old priests, good priests, who were. Uh, bullied and persecuted by their bishops. There was a rash of it back then also, and it was because they, you know, they wanted to maintain what it was that they were ordained to do. They didn't want to go along with the, the new liturgy and the reforms of Vatican II, and uh, so that they were uh, really heavily leaned on. It was never abrogated, the old mass, never. And it still hasn't been. You can't. It's protected by quo primum. Um, but they were bullied and, and badgered and put in insane asylums. And, you know, it, it was pretty sad to watch. And uh, this kind of thing is now happening again. So, If you've never read Quo Primum, Quo Primum was a document put out. Let's find it. Because it is one of the most astonishing documents I remember reading this. It was from Pope Pius V. Let me share it. Let's get rid of Mel for a second. We'll come back to him. So I'm not going to read the whole thing because obviously it's a, it's a big document. But this thing, I, I, I've heard arguments from... People and they say this isn't infallible, and I get it. You know, like infallible is is a high bar. I understand what that means, but just because something is isn't isn't infallible. I mean, Vatican II is not infallible. It's manifestly not infallible by the by the actual statements of the popes who oversaw the thing. It's a pastoral thing, and they define no new dogmas. But you know, we're told we're supposed to do forty backflips and figure out the mental gymnastics necessary to make sense of dignitatis humanae when it seems in complete contradiction to the entire history of the doctrinal patrimony of the church. But when you read Quo Primum, it's very clear. There's a line in here where the Pope says, furthermore, 
by these by these presents, this law, I guess. In virtue of our apostolic authority, we grant to concede in perpetuity that for the chanting or reading of the Mass in any church whatsoever, this missal is hereafter to be followed absolutely, without any scruple of conscience or fear of incurring any penalty, judgment, or censure, and may freely and lawfully be used. Nor are superiors, administrators, canons, chaplains, and other secular priests or religious of whatever title designated obliged to celebrate the Mass otherwise than as enjoined by us. We likewise declare and ordain that no one whoever is forced to coerce to alter this missal, and that this present document cannot be revoked or modified, but remain always valid and retain its full force notwithstanding the previous constitutions and decrees of the Holy See, as well as any general or special constitutions or edicts of provincial or synodal councils, and notwithstanding the practice and custom the aforesaid churches established by long and immemorial prescription, except, however, and more than 200 years standing. So, I, you know, again, I've heard from people that we're not supposed to think that, and I'm being honest here, like I understand there is a way to interpret things in a narrow sense, and and I get that, and, and, and like I, that's true. I mean, there is a proper context to interpret documents, but I mean, look at this language. It's unbelievable. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how we get around this. I've I, I've asked, and I've I've been told. Well, it's not infallible, and people are okay. This is why, and it's, I don't personally. I don't really find it convincing. It's. I'm not saying that I, I I can't be open to it, but it doesn't mean that you can't ever have another liturgy. That's true. Um, but I mean, it's very clear. It's in perpetuity. Perpetuity means forever. Now, it also says that even, you know, synods or provincial or synodal councils, meaning, you know, council of bishops, um, it can't be canceled. And no one whosoever is forced to coerce to, to alter this missile. You know, you can't be, <laughs> you can't be coerced to uh, alter. Now, I guess that would be a place where they would say, well, they're saying you can't be forced to alter it, so you obviously could alter it. And that makes perfect sense. I mean, I'm just spitballing here. Obviously, you know, just like the Council of Trent, the canons, you know, every council when it has canons, you do have to interpret it in line with with what is Catholic. Obviously, you know, people will try to use the Council of Trent to say, you know, it says you have to accept the mass uh, prescribed by the church. And they say, look, you don't like the Novus Ordo. And it's like, well, you also have to look at the Quill Primum. And also, no, the Novus Ordo didn't exist. <laughs> so it's not talking about the Novus Ordo because it didn't exist. Um, whereas this is very clear. It says this missile is never to be canceled. And I think this is what Pope Benedict said when he said it was never abrogated because it couldn't be. I think that he was just honoring it. And of course... You know, what's interesting, though, in a sense, even with the arrival of the new mass, it talks about altering the missile. This missile, I mean, they haven't altered the missile since the 1960s. I don't know. I guess they've made reforms in the past. But I guess what I'm trying to say here is Mel Gibson is saying you can't get rid of the old mass because of, quote, primum. I have not found a good answer where someone says we're supposed to just pretend this thing is not infallible. I get that not every piece, like not even in ecumenical councils, the descriptions of the canons are not necessarily infallible. That's just a, that's a basic teaching. St. Robert Bellarmine talks about that. Kajitan, I think does as well. You go to, th you go through Trent. It has anathemas, the anathema part. Yes. You have to follow that in its proper context. Uh, but the explanation, like, for example, transubstantiation is a dogma, but it's not as if the explanation of it is like binding on the church and under, under the pain of sin. Someone could have a better explanation or something like that. That's fine. So obviously this document, I mean, does it contain anathema? I don't think it does. Um, so I guess, you know, I guess that's something to think to take into account. But, 
I think it seems pretty clear. You're never supposed to get rid of it. And any sort of alterations would have to be un- in line with the spirit of how reform is. I mean, you just sort of tweak things. You don't make a new thing. Anyway, I don't, I, I agree with Gibson. I don't know how you get rid of, I don't know how you ignore quote premium. I, I don't know what is, how it's possible to do that. I've never heard in my, from my position, I've never heard a satisfactory explanation. Okay. Back to Gibson. And how are we supposed to know the good guys and the bad guys? Well, we were given a standard by which to judge them. You know, by their fruits, you'll know them. By their fruits. Anybody seen any good fruit lately? You know, it's tough. And look, I'm a pretty sinful guy. I mean, I'm, I'm as venal as the next guy. But I know the difference between a shepherd and a hireling. And I think that the vast majority of these bishops are just a bunch of hirelings. You know, and my question is, you know, like, who's hiring them? I don't think it's Jesus. Is it Francis? Who's hiring Francis? Is it, is it Pachamama? I mean, I think you need to look at the whole institution. And, uh, you know, I'll quote uh, Archbishop Vigano again in saying that uh, he believes that there was a parallel counterfeit church set up to eclipse the real one. He's suggesting usurpation or an inside job. It seems that way. Uh, Anyway, um, of course we know the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, the victory is God's, not ours. And uh, it will flourish if we keep it in our hearts. It can flourish in our hearts and keep the faith. And that's what's going to happen. That's what I encourage you to do. Again, I'm sorry for your for your pain, the injustice. Um, I'll definitely throw something in the hat um, to add my support. And uh, God keep you and God bless you. That was kind of funny. Who's was it? Pachamama. Um, two things: by their fruits, and keeping the faith in our hearts. That's actually more profound than you think. It sounds kind of emotionalist, but I'll explain why it's important. With the church, there's a threefold unity. So there's a unity of faith. There's a unity of governance, and there's a uni- unity of sacraments, essentially. So we demonstrate our unity with the church in an interior way first by the profession of the faith. And we demonstrate that and they demonstrate the expression of the interior faith externally by practicing the faith and professing it. So basically, you know, if you believe the faith, even if you're hidden, you're still uniting yourself to the faith of the church. That's kind of a way of understanding it. Then there's the unity of governance under the Pope and the bishops. That is both interior and exterior as well. Interiorly, you assent to this notion that you must, and you do. But exteriorly, there could be a moment where it is impossible. Thomas Aquinas talks about this. It just could be possible. Okay many different ways. And then the unity of sacraments, unity of, that's the communion. That's the, essentially, you know, you attend the sacraments with other Christians. The, obviously there's a, the sacraments are a salvific. It's not, it's not just a symbol, but they're, but as part of that real participation in the sacraments, it is known that you are united with another Christian. That's all that's, that's all that's needed. For unity between you and another Catholic. If you go to Mass and you pray the same prayers and you believe the same faith and you have the same shepherds, even if you can't always obey them in all circumstances because human the faculty of reason tells us we can't obey a superior in all things, in all circumstances. This is, again, Aquinas makes this very clear. So that principle is solid. 
But as long as you would go to a Catholic altar and you receive sacraments, you're in unity with other Christians, at least exteriorly. But you could be in disunity interiorly. You know, the people like to call people like myself schismatics, they're in schism with me. If they say if they say that about me, I, I don't I believe they're Catholic. If they believe I'm not, then that's the schism that they've created for themselves with me. It's I have nothing to do with it. And I think Gibson's getting at that. You know, if there is this counterfeit parallel church, which of course, you know, you get into prophecies like La Salette and stuff, who knows? But if that's true, and let's just say it would be impossible given because of circumstances that we can't overcome because how could we? We don't have the authority to. Let's just say it was possible that there was an inability to commune at the same altar for some impossible circumstance. Again, that's out of your control. If you keep the interior disposition, then you've somehow united yourself to the church. This is what a lot of these modernist anti-traditionalists don't understand about what it means to be in communion with the church. You know, St. Augustine, I talked about this yesterday or this morning whenever I did a, uh, uploaded another show, where he even talked about how there are people who are unjustly excommunicated um, and they're actually crowned because keeping the faith, even though they're excommunicated unjustly. So for all visible, the, the visible uh, reality is that they look like they're not united with the church, but in a way they're actually united more than the people who excommunicated them because they've kept the faith through injustice and haven't been the oppressor. Anyway. The last thing he talks about by their fruits. I've told this story before. If you've heard it, bear with me. So Christ talks about by their fruits. He often talks about by their fruits in the scriptures. And, or not, sorry, he says by their fruits you shall know them. And he often talks about fruit. <laughs> he talks about wine. He talks about um fig trees. I mean, he talks about these horticultural realities and they're not just metaphors. Metaphors and analogies and figures of speech, they pertain to real things. And if you don't understand those things, then it makes no sense. You know, for example, if you say, you know, to a, a child, I mean, my children, I mean, they've seen carts and horses because we've gone through Mennonite country. Uh, you know, but if a child has never seen a, a cart and a horse to say you put the cart before the horse, it makes absolutely no sense. But when you know how a cart and a horse works, then it makes perfect sense. It's, oh, I can see that would be a complete disaster. It wouldn't move anywhere. What does it mean when he talks about their fruits, you shall know them? Well, you have to look at the scriptures. You have to look at the gospels. And even in the Old Testament, a lot true as well. Where the various authors record Christ and prophets and so forth, talking about pruning the various vintages, the wine, the, the, the you know, uh, is it Isaiah in the Old Testament? You know, maybe it is, but, you know, the one the one wine becomes sour versus the, the other wine, you know, old, old wine and new wineskins, all this imagery about wine and fruit and orchards and trees and fig trees. And why is that? And what does that mean? It's not just some fanciful metaphor of, of by their fruits, you know, so as long as there's a sweet harvest, that means that tree's good. That's not what it means. I grew up around vinters. My no-no, God rest his soul, made wine. My mom's family in Italy, they've had orchards and they've had olive groves and vineyards and things like that for centuries. And I spent some time around there and was lucky enough to spend time of my, some of my youth growing up there. And anyway, I learned a little bit about wine and, and um, sadly I don't make it today, but I did learn that you don't know whether or not you're going to get a consistent crop until the plant is 50 years old. I was at a winery tour with the friends a few years ago. It was a new winery and I was talking with one of my friends and I said, I wonder where they got these grapes from, you know, where they plant, where they get them before they planted them. 
And he said, what do you mean? This place is only three years old. I said, I know, but the grapes have to be at least like 50 years old before you make wine. He's like, that's insane. They're three years old. So he puts up his hand and he asks the sommelier, you know, when did you plant these? And she said, oh, three years ago. He looks at me and goes, ha ha, gotcha. And I said, okay, that's not true. The sommelier continues and said, no, 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 but hold on. They came over from France and they were about 47 years old when we got them. And at that point, they were, the wine was about 49, the grapes were about 49 years old. They were still blending with wine, with grapes from somewhere else, with the local ones, because the plants were not producing consistently and they weren't sure which ones they were going to keep after that 50 year mark. And after that 50 year mark, you actually have to get rid of them. They're useless. And if you're not careful, they can actually contribute to funguses and things like that that can destroy the other ones. This is why Christ says, you know, you have to cast them into the fire. The bad trees can't bear good fruit. And similar things happen with other types of fruit trees as well. By their fruits is not just a nice metaphor. You know, you talk to people who go to like a charismatic renewal event or something and say, wow, look at the good fruit from there. And it's like, okay, it was a positive experience. And I'm not dumping on the charismatic renewal. I'm just saying, Sure, you went down to Steubenville and the kids all, you know, said they got slain in the spirit or whatever. And then they went home and they continued committing mortal sins and they don't go to church anymore except for a few of them. There's no good fruits there. They had an emotional experience and maybe some of them had a supernatural one, but the fruits are nothing. You know the fruits in someone's life and in the life of the church after decades. That is what Christ is telling us. You know the fruits after half a century. The new Mass was implemented in 1970. Thereabouts. 50 years later, almost to the day, seemingly, the new Mass decided to commit suicide. I'm talking about the lockdowns. By their fruits... You shall know them. As soon as the orchard of the new mass had reached its maturity, it decided that it was irrelevant. It, it, died, it decided that it would cancel itself. If you wanted to find mass during the lockdowns, if you wanted to find priests that weren't going to enforce vaccine passports, you didn't go to the new mass. Now, there will be exceptions because there are always exceptions, but exceptions prove the rule. The traditionalists who celebrated the perennial mass of Pius V of Quo Primum, the mass that has stood the test of time and whose branches had been sufficiently pruned over centuries and millennia so that it could continue to produce good fruit, survived. And when the other suppressed itself, the one that stood the test of time flourished. And now this is what we see. The Pope wants to throw the good trees into the fire and continue to try to graft onto and transplant the poisonous branches of the tree that does not bring life to the church. It won't work. And as Gibson said, ultimately it's God's victory. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. This has been the Kennedy Report, and until next time, God bless.